banking crisis and massive bailouts have already come to pass. The still unfolding scenario includes hyperinflation, collapse of the economy, a new global currency, domestic violence, UN peacekeeping forces in the US, and the arrival of high-tech feudalism. We are ready now for the final trip in our time machine. On the control panel in front of us are several selector switches. The one on the left indicates direction of time. Set it to future. The switch on the right indicates primary assumptions. Set it to the first notch, which reads present trends unaltered. Leave the secondary assumption switch where it is. The lever in the center is a throttle to determine speed of travel. Nudge it forward and hang on tight. The new world order steps to total control. It is 4.05 in the morning. While New York City sleeps, the computers on the fourth floor at Citibank are aware that a full-blown crisis is underway. It started in London, five hours ahead of the East Coast, and within minutes had spread like an electronic virus to Tokyo and Hong Kong. That was an hour ago. Alarms are now sounding on computer terminals in all the trading centers of the world, and automatic dialing services are summoning money managers to their boardrooms. The panic started from rumors that one of the large U.S. banks was in trouble because of the simultaneous default of its loan to Mexico and the bankruptcy of its second largest corporate borrower. Yesterday afternoon, the bank's president held a press conference and denied that these were serious problems. To reinforce his optimism, he announced that on Friday, the bank will be paying a higher than usual quarterly dividend. The professional money managers were not convinced. They knew that writing off these loans would wipe out the bank's entire net worth. By 5 a.m., the money center banks are facing heavy withdrawals from overseas depositors. By the time the sun peaks between the New York skyscrapers, Americans are also taking their money. These are not small transactions. They involve other banks, insurance companies, and investment funds. The average withdrawal is over $3 million. The reservoir is draining fast. It is now 7.45. The banks will soon be opening their doors, and already newspaper reporters and TV crews are arriving outside. A plan of unified action must be made quickly. The chairman of the Federal Reserve has arranged an emergency conference call with the CEOs of all the major banks including one who was located at great effort at his fishing lodge in northern Canada. The president is also tied into the telephone network, but on a silent monitor basis. Other than the chairman, no one else knows he is listening. The new world order steps to total control. The CEO at Citibank quickly summarizes the problem. None of the banks will be able to sustain withdrawals of this magnitude for more than about 48 hours, perhaps less. The money is not in their vaults. It has been put into interest-bearing loans. Even if the loans were performing, they would not have the money. Now that some of the larger loans are in default, the problem is even worse. If the Fed doesn't provide the money, the banks will have no choice but to close their doors and go out of business. That would cause a collapse of the economy, and untold suffering would follow. Americans would be thrown out of work, families would go hungry, national security would be weakened. And it would undoubtedly spread to the entire world. Who knows what dire consequences would follow? Chaos, famine, and riots here at home? Revolution abroad? The return of a militaristic regime in Russia? Atomic war? The chairman cuts the monologue short. He is well aware that the banks must not be allowed to fail. That, after all, was one of the reasons the Federal Reserve was created. He wants to get on with the details of how to do it. Yes, the FDIC is already broke, but don't worry about that. Congress will authorize a loan or some other mechanism for the Fed to create whatever amount of new money the FDIC might need. If Congress moves too slowly, the Fed has other technical means to accomplish the same result. In the meantime, unlimited funding will be available at the Fed's discount window by 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The printing presses are already running at full capacity to provide the currency. 
fleets of airplanes and armored cars are standing by to deliver it. Furthermore, don't give up on those defaulted loans. Congress will probably bail out the bankrupt American corporations, and the President has said he will ask for additional funding for the IMF World Bank. That money will be created by the Fed and carry the stipulation that it must be used by Mexico and other defaulting countries to resume interest payments on their loans. The bankers are told to open their doors to the public and act calm. The press already knows that something is going on, but not the seriousness of it. So tell them only what they already know, nothing more. If people want to withdraw their money, give it to them. If lines should develop, call the police to maintain order, but continue paying out. Offer to stay open after closing hours if necessary to accommodate everyone. Above all, have the tellers take their time. Check and double check each transaction. Move the lines slowly. The armored trucks will arrive at the busiest hours, so the guards can carry sacks of money past the customers for visual confirmation that there is enough for everyone. A bank officer then should tell the crowd that a fresh delivery of money has just been made from the Federal Reserve System, and that there is plenty more where that came from. Once people become convinced that the bank is able to pay, most of them will tire of the wait and go on. The New World Order steps to total control. It is now 6 p.m. of the following day. The plan was successful. Lines of anxious depositors had formed yesterday morning, mostly in the larger cities, and resumed again this morning. But there has been enough money for everyone. The news media treated the story lightly, making sure to include sound bites from various experts that banks can no longer fail, thanks to the FDIC and the Federal Reserve System. More than half the video time is devoted to armored trucks and guards carrying sacks of money. The banks closed on schedule today, and there were no more lines. While everything appears calm to the passengers on deck, the fire still rages out of control in the boiler room. Over a billion dollars has already fled, mostly overseas, and the hemorrhage continues. The Fed is pumping in fresh money to replace it. Two of the banks have instructed their computer technicians to activate an automatic two-hour delay on all incoming transactions. There is talk of deliberately disabling the entire network and blaming the breakdown on overload, but the idea is abandoned. There are too many people in the system. Someone surely would leak the truth to the press. The danger of a run on the banks by private depositors used to be the nightmare of the Federal Reserve. Now it is nothing compared to the electronic run that is taking place involving institutional depositors around the world. These are professionals who are not impressed by armed guards carrying bags of currency. They want their money now, and they are getting it. Although they are receiving it in the form of electronic credits, they are immediately exchanging that for something more dependable, such as stocks, other currencies, and bullion. This is the Fed's finest hour. It is exercising its many powers, carefully accumulated over the years, to create money out of whatever is at hand. U.S. Treasury bonds, bonds from other governments, corporate debt obligations, even direct loans to individuals and partnerships. Billions of new dollars are springing into existence. They are spreading around the globe to fulfill the bank's obligation to give people back their money. It is now seven weeks later. Something happened, but no one knows what. Like a spark igniting a twig, spreading to a branch, and then engulfing the entire forest, the public has panicked. Responding to a primitive herd instinct, they are descending on the banks and the thrifts. They want their money. They want their savings. Perhaps it was the newly released statistics showing higher unemployment or the continued rise in bankruptcies, or the congressional vote to increase the national debt again, or the jump in social security taxes, or the loss of another 140,000 jobs to Mexico, or the riots in Chicago and Detroit for more food stamps and government housing, or the presence of UN peacekeeping troops to augment the National Guard, or the rumor that the Bank of America
America was technically insolvent, or the UN World Court ruling that the number of American automobiles had to be cut by 30% by December 31st, or the skeptical tone in the voice of the CBS news anchor as he quoted the latest prediction of renewed prosperity. Whatever it was, there are now long lines of sober-faced depositors outside every bank. There is not enough cash in the vaults to meet the demand. Most money is checkbook money, which means it consists merely of magnetic impulses in a computer. Only about 5% of the monetary supply is in the form of coins or currency. Most of that is already outside the banks, in cash registers, wallets, and mattresses. The amount inside the banks is only about one half of one percent. The Fed's emergency supply of currency, a large quantity warehoused for exactly this kind of crisis, is inadequate. This time the printing presses cannot keep up. Spokesmen from the Treasury and the Federal Reserve appear on TV and assure the nation that there is no need for panic, everything is under control, the only problem is the irrational behavior of alarmists who have no faith in their country. No one believes them. The lines grow longer, and the people become angry. Bank employees are jeered on their way to work. Bomb threats are made. Sporadic violence breaks out, and bank windows are smashed. The International Guard is called up. The president declares a bank holiday. Since people cannot close out their bank accounts by withdrawing currency, they rush through the stores on checkbook spending sprees. If they cannot get their money back, at least they can buy things with it. Garages and basements are filling up with canned goods, shoes, liquor, tires, ammunition. Goods are becoming scarce, pushing prices upward. The Dow Jones is going through the roof as investors empty their checking accounts to buy anything for sale. The Securities and Exchange Commission finally suspends trading. Nine months have now passed. The crisis has been a blessing for politicians. They have thrived upon it and grown in stature because of it. It has given them an excuse to swarm through the country on fact-finding trips, to appear in shirt sleeves at town hall meetings, to give speeches and to be seen on television, all the time expressing grave concern and appearing to take charge. It has legitimized their role and somehow made them seem more necessary than before. They have been converted in the public eye from oafs and bumpkins to serious-minded statesmen. The party in power said it inherited the mess. The previous party blamed the current one for dropping the ball. Both parties, however, agreed on the solution. More of exactly the same policies that created the crisis. Expanded power to the Federal Reserve, more government control over the economy, more subsidies and benefits, and more international commitments. These were called emergency reforms and became law. The same men who created the problem prescribed the solution. The public was grateful to have leaders of such vision and wisdom. The New World Order steps to total control. The most important emergency reform was to bail out the banks with taxpayers' dollars. Defaulted foreign loans were taken over by the IMF World Bank, and the failing corporate borrowers were given government grants disguised as loans, loans which everyone knew would never be paid back. Next, the banks were nationalized, at least in part. In return for the bailout money, they gave large blocks of stock to the government, which now operates as an official business partner. This was not a drastic change. The banks were already heavily regulated by government, even to the point of determining their profits, dividends, and executive salaries. That is the way the cartel wanted it. It was the means by which competition was avoided and profits assured. Monetary scientists and political scientists have always worked as a hidden partnership. This merely made the relationship more visible. Technically, no bank was allowed to fail. The Fed kept its promise on that. When the troubled banks were taken over, all depositors with $100,000 or less were fully protected. If they wanted their money and the bank didn't have it, the Fed simply manufactured it. No one was worried about the value of those dollars. They were just happy to have them. 
10 more months have now passed. Those new dollars are flooding throughout the system. The money supply has increased by the amount of the bailout plus the amount of new spending for welfare, health care, interest on the national debt, and foreign aid, all of which are in a vertical climb. Inflation has become institutionalized. The dollar has been dethroned as the world's de facto currency. Foreign investors and central banks no longer have any use for dollars. They have sent them back to the United States whence they came. Trillions of them have returned to our shores like a huge flock of homing pigeons that fills the sky from horizon to horizon. They are buying our refrigerators, automobiles, computers, airplanes, cargo ships, armored tanks, office buildings, factories, real estate, pushing prices to levels that would have seemed impossible a year ago. A single postage stamp costs as many dollars as once would have purchased a new TV set. Most stores have stopped accepting checks and credit cards. Workers are paid daily with bundles of paper money. People rush to the stores to purchase groceries before prices rise even further. Commerce is paralyzed. Bank loans and mortgages are unobtainable. Savings accounts have been destroyed, including the cash values of insurance policies. Factories are shutting down. Businesses are closing their doors. Barter is commonplace. Old silver coins come out of private hoards, and a hundred dollar bill is exchanged for one silver dime. Following the crash of 1929, the supply of paper money was limited because it was backed by silver, and the amount of silver itself was limited. Those who had money were able to buy up the assets of those who did not. Since prices were falling, the longer they held on to their dollars, the more they could buy. Now things are exactly the opposite. There is nothing to back the money supply, except politics. There is no limit to the amount of currency that can be created. It is just a question of printing and delivering it. Money is abundant, and prices are rising. Those who have money are spending it as soon as possible to prevent further loss of purchasing power. In the 1930s, everyone wanted dollars. Now, everyone wants to get rid of them. The Emergency Banking Regulation No. 1, originally issued in 1961, empowered the Secretary of the Treasury, without consent of Congress, to seize anyone's bank account, savings account, or safe deposit box. It also gave him the power to fix rents, prices, salaries, and hourly wages, and to impose rationing. This was to be done in the event of attack on the United States. That phrase now has been changed to read, in the event of national emergency. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has been expanded to administer the directives of the Treasury. FEMA also has the power to detain and forcibly relocate any citizen in the event of a national emergency. The new world order steps to total control. Three more months have passed and the President has declared a state of national emergency. Today, the Secretary of the Treasury announced that the nations of the world had ratified a multilateral treaty that would solve the inflationary problems of the United States. This will be accomplished through the issuance of a new worldwide monetary unit called the Bancor, the name proposed by John Maynard Keynes at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. This new money will restore our commerce and put a stop to inflation. At last, said the Treasury Secretary, man will have total control over his economic destiny. Money will now become his servant instead of his master. The United States, he said, has agreed to accept the Bancor as legal tender for all debts, public and private. The old money will still be honored but will be phased out over a three-month period. After that date, Federal Reserve notes will no longer be valid. During the transition period, the old money may be exchanged at any bank at the ratio of one Bancor for $500. All existing contracts expressed in dollars, including home mortgages, are now converted to Bancors in that same ratio. In the same announcement, the Secretary advised that the IMF World Bank 
was backing this new money with something far more precious than gold. Instead, it will be backed by the assets of the world. These include bonds from the participating governments, plus millions of acres of wilderness lands that have been deposited into the UN Environmental Bank. The national parks and forests of the United States have been added to those reserves, and they will now be under the supervision of the UN Wilderness Asset Preservation Enhancement Agency, WAPIA. From this date forward, the Federal Reserve System will operate as a subdivision of the IMF, which is now the central bank of the world. Although the Secretary did not mention it in his public appearance, the UN Treaty also obligated the government to put restrictions on the use of cash. Every citizen is to be issued an international ID card. The primary purpose of these machine-readable cards is to provide positive identification for all citizens at transportation depots and military checkpoints. They also can be used by the banks and stores to access checking accounts, which are now called debit accounts. Every citizen is being issued an account in a bank near his place of residence. All payments by employers or government agencies will be made by electronic transfer. Cash transactions larger than five bank cores will be illegal in three months. Most expenditures will be paid by debit card. That is the only way in which the UN Monetary Transaction Tracking Agency, MTTA, can combat counterfeiting and prevent money laundering by organized crime. That, of course, is camouflage. The government complex issuing the new money is the greatest perpetrator of counterfeiting and organized crime the world has ever seen. The real targets are political dissidents and those escaping taxes in the underground economy. No one will be allowed to earn or buy or sell without this ID card nor will they be allowed to leave the country or even to migrate to another city. If any government agency has reason to red flag an individual, his card will not clear, and he will be blocked from virtually all economic transactions and geographical movements. It is the ultimate control. The new money offers the cabal yet one more benefit. There can never be another run on the banks because it is now illegal to demand currency. A new world order steps to total control. Hyperinflation is fertile ground for the seeds of revolution. Economic despair led the masses to grasp at the promises of Lenin in Russia, Hitler in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, and Mao in China. It has now been three years since that fateful run on the banks in New York, and inflation has not abated, even with the introduction of the Bancor. Now we are witnessing massive public demonstrations in every major city for higher wages, more jobs, larger government benefits, and more stringent price controls. Since there are practically no goods in the stores at any price, the demonstrators are also calling for higher output from government factories. The demonstrations have been organized by radical organizations advocating the overthrow of the decadent capitalist system and the enthronement of socialism in its place. The participants in the street do not understand the words they chant. They are unaware that capitalism has been dead in America for many years and that it is socialism they already have. Nevertheless, there are tens of thousands of desperate people who are attracted to the rhetoric of revolution. Terrorism and revolutionary insurgency have become common occurrences in the major urban areas. The ranks of the revolutionaries are swelled by those who come solely for the looting that always follows. People are frightened by these violent events and demand the restoration of law and order. They are relieved when martial law is declared. They are happy to see the International Guard patrolling their neighborhoods. They are not resentful of being confined in their homes or arbitrarily detained by soldiers. They are actually grateful for the omnipresence of the police state. It is curious that the revolutionary groups behind this violence have not been inhibited by the government. 
To the contrary, they have been given grants from CFR organizations, and their leaders have been treated courteously by CFR politicians. The CFR media have given them extended coverage in the news and has presented their cause with sympathy. A few dissidents have begun to wonder if the revolutionaries are but the unknowing pawns of those in power, and that their primary function is to frighten the population into accepting the constraints of a police state. Such voices, however, are quickly silenced. Those who question the government or the media are branded as extremists at the lunatic fringe. Authorities say that they are the cause of our present woes. They are the remnants of the old system based on profit-seeking and race-hating. They are guilty of politically incorrect attitudes and hate crimes. They are sentenced to attitude correction centers for psychological...